All right. Hello, everyone. First of all, Happy New Year. We survived 2020 somehow, <laughs> barely. Uh, thank you so much for joining me here today. My name is Maria Wickvila. I'm a Harvard Business School grad and the founder of ApplicantLab.com. And today I am going to cover a couple of success stories of people who managed to crack the Harvard Stanford Wharton uh, sort of the trinity of the top business schools of Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton. Um, it, it's funny that we're doing this session today uh, because coincidentally on the day of the recording, today is actually the deadline for Harvard and Wharton and tomorrow is the deadline for Stanford. So if you are applying to those programs and you are submitting your application in the next couple of hours, I'm not sure that I'm gonna <laughs> be able to help you a lot, uh, but if you are looking to apply to some of these programs in the future, uh, I, I'm hoping that some of these examples will help you, you know, maybe start to get a sense of your competitiveness. Uh, if you're a few years out from applying, my hope is that by seeing the stories of the, some of the people who get into these programs, it might help guide you in making decisions in terms of how involved you get at work, how much leadership do you take in community service, et cetera, et cetera. So without any further ado, let me see. Hold on, let me share a screen. You know, it's always, we can do so many amazing technological things. Okay, there we go. I'm like, we can do so many amazing technological things and yet for some reason, it's sometimes hard to share screens. All right. so. Like I said before, hi, I'm Maria. This is me. Uh, I went to Harvard Business School. I graduated almost 16 years ago, yikes. Uh, and I am the founder of applicantlab.com, which is a DIY option to overprice admissions consultants. And I save you thousands and thousands of dollars on admissions advice. So if you are watching this uh, and I'm, you know, given again, the fact that deadlines happen to be today, I'm hoping that you're watching this looking ahead to the future, to a future application. Uh, as you start to wade in the waters of MBA admissions land, you're going to start to encounter people who are called admissions consultants. I'm an admissions consultant, but I'm a different type of admissions consultant. Other admissions consultants, uh, you'll quickly realize that their prices are pretty high. Uh, you know, here are just some sample, you know, screen grabs from a few uh, different folks in the field. So 365 an hour uh, with a minimum of two hour purchase, 480 per hour with a six hour minimum. Uh, here's someone who purchased, it's $1,000 for two hours, which comes out to $500 per hour. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's great, but that's also a lot of money and that's really out of reach for a lot of people. And even if people have that kind of money, it may not necessarily be what they want to spend it on. So what I have done is I created applicantlab.com. Uh, I level the playing field. So what I've done is I have taken my now almost 18, going on 18 years of admissions experience, and I have created an online tool that basically walks you through the same steps and the same exercises that I would walk you through if I were working with you one-on-one, -on -one. but since it's online and digital, it costs significantly less. So it costs less than one hour of what other admissions consultants want to charge you for just one hour of their time. So by going through Applicant Lab, my hope is that you can save a lot of money. Now, it's I think it's a pretty cool product, but it's not just, you know, obviously you're like, oh, well, she's biased, of course. Don't just take my word for it. Uh, I entered the Harvard Business School Alumni Venture Competition a couple of years ago where I won the audience favorite in my regional competition. Uh, I am the only admission service that is endorsed by the Harbus, which is the Harvard Business School student newspaper. And on GMAT Club itself, uh, I'm currently up to over 120 five-star reviews. Uh, there are lots of ways to use Applicant Lab. First of all, you can just use it by yourself and then get a friend or a colleague to review some of your materials. I do have handy checklists within the lab that you can give to your friend or colleague. So even if they don't know a whole lot about MBA admissions, hopefully they can follow the checklist and help you, you know, help tell you if you're hitting the right notes or not with your materials. You can also hire us. Um, I have a team. It's actually, there are, we've got 
a lab alumni. So people who have used Applicant Lab in the past, successfully attended and graduated from a top program, and now they're coming back and they are helping out uh, people who need help with their resumes, essays, interview prep, et cetera. And I do wanna highlight that we do have some of the lowest prices on the market for people of the caliber uh, that we are offering to you. So I've got Wharton, Columbia, Ross, uh, Duke, Fuqua, Booth alums, right? So I've got alums from a lot of the top programs but we charge a lot less than the other admissions consulting firms do. And the reason for that is that since you do more work on your own in Applicant Lab first before sending us your materials, it means that we have to do less work <laughs> to do things like review your resume, right? So if you were starting from scratch and you had this sort of disaster dog's breakfast mess of a resume and you sent it to us, well, we'd have to start from scratch and we would need you know, several hours uh, to, to try to whip that into shape. But if you go through all of the steps in the lab first and then you send us a resume, it will not be as much work. Therefore, we pass those savings on to you. And then finally, you can use Applicant Lab with some other consultant. Uh, you can, for example, use the lab exercises first and then hire, say, you know, a three hour or a six hour package someplace else. Or if you are using uh, another admissions consultant in a kind of holistic, uh, you know, all in package type of thing. You know, if you're going to spend four thousand, eight thousand, ten thousand dollars or more with another admissions consultant, Applicant Lab can be a great insurance policy, right? That way, you can, if your admissions, if your expensive admissions consultant is telling you to do X, Y, and Z, why not spend a couple hundred extra bucks, get Applicant Lab, and check to see if the advice that they're giving you matches the advice that I give. If the two places match, it's a pretty good sign that you're on the right path. All right, so with that out of the way, what are we gonna talk about today? Um, so I know that specifically the topic is, you know, people who got into Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton. And we're gonna do that, don't worry. But I think instead of just going through like these random different bios and, and examples, I think first it's really important for all of us to be on the same page in terms of understanding what are admissions officers looking for especially at these elite programs. Because once we have that sort of general sense, then later when I start telling you about the success stories, hopefully it won't come as a big surprise, like how did that, you know, how did that person get accepted? Hopefully once we talk about how a lot of admissions officers think, it won't be such a surprise. Uh, and then we're gonna go through a few specific success stories. Uh, and in case you're like, oh, well, it's only like these perfect, applicants who get in like yeah it doesn't hurt to be a perfect applicant but lots of other people who otherwise have quote unquote weaknesses in the admissions uh process also get in so people who are younger than average by which i mean people who graduated who are applying um let's say about two maybe three years post undergraduate uh, as a side note if you're new to this process if you have less than two years of post undergraduate experience please don't apply to business schools at least not the ones in the u.s because it will be difficult for you to get in but i've got a couple of examples here of a couple of young people who cracked these top three schools um indian tech candidates i know that gmat club a lot of you folks might be from india and uh the indian tech candidate is one of the most competitive pools just because there's so many of you <laughs> And so it can be hard to stand out. So it is unfortunately kind of the hardest group or one of the hardest groups to get accepted from. Uh, an old candidate, this is someone with more than 10 years of experience. Usually when someone has more than 10 years of experience, they are often advised to not really even bother uh, with top US MBA programs. And I actually tend to agree with them <laughs> with that advice, but it is possible. So let's look at that guy. Uh, and then an entrepreneur. And then at the end, we're going to have sort of a takeaway and summary of what I think some of the distinctions are between Harvard, Wharton, and Stanford. I do believe that there are nuances and differences between what the three programs are looking for. So we'll summarize that at the end. All right. So first of all, to make sure that we're all on the same page, I have created this concept that I call the ADCOM hierarchy of needs. If you ever studied psychology, you might have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Basically, the idea is this. You cannot advance to the next highest level on this hierarchy until you have successfully satisfied the requirements of the lower level. 
So in other words, if you have, if let's say you've got really good leadership at the top of the pyramid, but your academic history is just really, really bad, like, well, you know, you've got like a, I don't know, a 400 GMAT and you failed out of college three times, like, you know what I mean? Like a really bad academic story it's going to be pretty hard for your application to be considered at that higher level if you don't first satisfy some of the basic requirements at the bottom of the pyramid. So let's walk through uh, how these different things, what you know, how they're ascertained and what they mean. So first of all, academics, primarily your ability at math, uh, because business school does have some pretty analytical classes. And so they the, the number one way that this is uh, determined is through your GMAT slash GRE score, aka a standardized test, because every college has a different scoring system and every professor has a different scoring system. And how are you supposed to compare people, uh, you know, with, with different transcripts from different colleges? So the GRE GMAT is a real boon to people because it does let you compete on a global level and show that your academic capacity is sort of within this high percentile on a global level and not just within your individual college. They do also look at your previous academic performance, uh, but I but the GMAT GRE is more important because it's standardized. So EQ, this stands for emotional quotient. I think it's important to realize that a lot of people think that getting into business school is about IQ, showing how smart you are. Mm, not really. Once you pass that lower bar of the academics, it doesn't really matter so much. It is more about EQ. And how could I summarize that in terms of what how a business school would think about it? I think it's a proven ability to win people over. Uh, having real evidence of in the past persuading others to do things that maybe at first they didn't want to do, or maybe at first they disagreed with you. Um, and, and why does this matter? Well, on a basic level, because they want to accept people who are good people, uh, but also it enhances the school's reputation. So that way, if you have good EQ, when you graduate, you're not going to embarrass the program, right? You're not going to become this toxic boss that screams at everyone. And then people are like, oh, no, graduates from that program, all they do is scream, right? The schools realize that they have a brand to uphold and that their brand is only as good as the people they let in. So they don't want to let in people who are screamers or, you know, sociopaths. Uh, and they also want to avoid, avoid embarrassment. Um, either they don't want to let you in if you're a bad person or if you're going to end up in jail, which happens sometimes more than you might think. Then moving up, uh, assuming that you are, you're pretty smart and you're a pretty good person, uh, then they really look at the career placement likelihood. So the track record of employability or showing that you have what it takes to get jobs in a difficult job market. At its core, the main reason people go to business school is to improve their careers on some level. And so you need to show that you have a history of doing well in your career. Is this someone who can get hired? Is this someone who maybe gets fired a lot? And if they get fired a lot, what does that say about, you know, is it them? Maybe it's they're, they're the ones who are problematic here. Um, so this is why sometimes when people jump around from job to job to job, you know, I have six months at this job and three months at that job and two months at the other job and you ask them why and they're like, oh, because everyone at this company was stupid and then everyone at the next company was also stupid. At a certain point, it's the candidate. <laughs> it's not the company, right? So they're also on the lookout for the ability because they're thinking about, okay, who are the corporate recruiters who are coming to our campus? If we put this candidate in front of this recruiter, is the recruiter going to be like, yes, awesome. This is great. I Man, I always know. Whenever I come to this school, I know I'm going to get great people for my company, right? That's the reaction they want the recruiters to get. So that's why career likely... Uh, the placement likelihood for your career matters a lot. And then finally, leadership. This is like the pinnacle of the pyramid. Uh, leadership can be defined in lots of different ways. But if I had to summarize it, I would say it's the ability to make things happen, but not by yourself, alone in a cubicle, crunching numbers. That's self-discipline. That's IQ, but that's not leadership. Leadership is making good things happen through the efforts of other people, persuading, motivating other people to do things, to work together, to overcome obstacles so that ultimately something good happens, whether it's something good within a specific team, just a little project that goes that maybe the project was going off the rails and you come in and you get it back on track. Uh, maybe the entire company um, was headed in the wrong direction or needed some, you know, some change, or maybe the influence for a, a leader extends even beyond their own company. 
So just a heads up, the more elite a business school is, the higher the bar is for each of these factors, right? So it's not just when sometimes people just look at like the average GMAT scores of a program and they're like, well, my GMAT score is kind of at that average. So therefore I'm competitive for that program. Not necessarily because while the academics, someone's academics might be on par, those higher levels of the pyramid might not be. Uh, and not only is the bar higher, but the stronger your competition is, right? The You're going to be competing against people who are perhaps, you know, real stars within their companies. And so that's another thing you need to keep in mind is who's your competition. So just to be clear, the academics are just a hurdle to cross. Uh, and it's a very quick way to compare against otherwise identical applicants. The academic piece is not a linear component necessarily in admissions. So what I mean by that is if somebody has a 750 and another candidate has a 760, that doesn't mean that the person with a 760 is automatically in better shape than the person with a 750, right? It's not, it's more about like, okay, if I let this person in, are they going to do okay in my classes or are they going to flunk out? Are they going to enjoy the academic experience or are they going to be completely stressed out of their minds and, and freaking out over how hard it is, right? So that's, they basically want to know, can this person do the work at our school? And if the answer to that is yet, yes, and you've proven that in some way, at that point, that bottom level doesn't matter as much. Um, and at this point, you know, what, what I would summarize this as is I would say at this point, a low score can probably keep you out, but a high score doesn't automatically get you in. And also, furthermore, if you have a lower than average score, as long as you cross some sort of base level bar of competence, of academic competence, you can mitigate that lower score if at the top of the pyramid, you are a really strong performer. So in other words, once the basic academic bar is crossed, you move up the hierarchy and the upper levels become more and more important. The more elite the school is, the more important that top of the pyramid becomes. So this can help explain, you know, if you've started hanging out on GMAT Club uh, and you start reading, you know, especially about a month ago, some of the early round one decision results came in, right? And often GMAT Club is such a wonderful online community and there are so many people engaged with it. And often people will say things like, oh, I got in, awesome, or oof, I didn't get in, ooh, this was, wow, I'm really disappointed, right? And so sometimes you might read like people saying, yeah, I don't understand, I had a 780 GMAT, I had an almost perfect GMAT score, and I had a really strong academic record, but I didn't get accepted. Well, the hierarchy of needs explains why when you see on a message board, someone who has, let's say, a GMAT score of 780, which if you're new to GMAT land is almost a perfect score. But if that person is, say, a QA engineer who has never really proposed any innovations at work, right? If this is a person who, let's say, yeah, I just test other people's software uh, and I make notes of the bugs and then maybe I fix the bugs. But, you know, I show up at 9 a.m., you know, I leave at 7 p.m., I just do my job with my head, you know, focused on my desk. I'm not really proposing any changes to the company. I'm not really innovating anything. You know, that person, obviously, they pass that academic hurdle with flying colors. But if they're not really doing things to be a leader within their company, their team, or their community, it's not as, you know, it's a lot less likely that it's going to work out for them. So that's why someone with that kind of a, of a profile might work might be worse off than someone, let's say, who launched new products or for their company or who pivoted the business and said, hey, guys, you know, we've always been focused on this market. Why don't we pivot into another market? And they do. And it's great and it's successful. Like, that's why someone who does something like that at their company, even if they have a lower GMAT score, um, you know, they <laughs> they might still get in. Uh, and also one quick note on the EQ piece. Sometimes another thing that you'll often see is someone who maybe has had a lot of good leadership at work, right? Maybe they have proposed amazing things and maybe they also have the 780. But if they come across in their essays or in their interview as arrogant, unlikable, full of themselves, unpleasant, it's over. It's not even going to matter sometimes what that leadership is. If that person is just a oh, just comes across as a real jerk, it's that's also over too. So that's another big reason you'll off, you know, you'll often see these like, I'm so surprised that I didn't get in. And if you ever see that, think back to this concept. 
Um, I also want to point out, I actually have data to prove that GMAT isn't everything. It's not that be all and end all. Uh, because a lot of the top programs have actually pretty similar GMAT scores. Not, you know, entirely identical, but pretty close enough, especially when you look at the percentiles, right? So on the left-hand side here, we've got a chart that I took from MBA.com of what are the total, you know, what is the percentile for some of these scores, right? So a 740 is 97th percentile and a 730 is 96th percentile, right? So at a certain point, once you get up to these high 90th percentiles, you're really sort of splitting hairs uh, in terms of how good a score is. So if we look at uh, the school names, I've got Harvard, uh, Stanford, Harvard, and Wharton here. Uh, they're ranking, right? So these are the top, I mean, I don't think that the ranking necessarily matters because I think that I think that it's, I, in my head, it's like Harvard, Stanford, Wharton are like this kind of bucket above, and then there are other buckets uh, below that. But for what it's worth, those are the, the most recent rankings. And the reason I chose this ranking is because it's an amalgamation of all the other rankings. So it's like your one-stop shop for rankings. So anyway, these are like the top three, four programs. Uh, and if you look at the average GMAT, uh, you know, 734, 728, 732, look at the percentile. 96.4, 95.6, and 96.2. And the reason I even took it out to one decimal place is because if you round all of those, it's all 96. <laughs> the 95.6 rounds up to 96 and the other ones round down to 96, right? So they are, they're pretty much identical. Uh, and so you're like, okay, fine, it's 96%. We get it. But like, those are the top three programs. But yet the quote unquote lower ranked programs, and that's a term that gives me the heebie-jeebies because as you'll see, as, as you may have seen in some of my other presentations, the ranks don't really necessarily mean a whole lot per se. But anyway, you might be like, okay, but what about the lower rank programs? It's not that different, right? If you look at Haas, Haas is most recently sort of number eight, Tuck in the PNQ rankings number nine, and then Yale and NYU. I bucketed them together just because they had the same average GMAT. Uh, so Yale's ranked 10th and NYU Stern is ranked 16th. And if you look at the, the percentiles on the side, I mean, it's it's lower. But it's not like dramatically lower. I mean, at a certain point, if someone is 95th percentile versus 96th percentile or 94th percentile versus whatever, like, come on, right? I mean, these are these are essentially very similar. It, you're, you're, again, you're splitting hairs, right? We're not talking like, oh, the Stanford people have a 96th percentile and then anything below that is like 20th percentile, right? We're not talking about a dramatic difference. Um, and yet, look at the differences in the acceptance rates, right? So Stanford is at around six, around 7% in the past. Um, I wonder if a lot of these, this, this past COVID year, being the most competitive year perhaps in a long time. I don't know if these acceptance rates will go down. But you'll look, Stanford's around 6 to 7%. I think they're going to go down to 6 this year. Um, Harvard's at around 11 to 12. And Wharton's at about 23. So right off the bat, the acceptance rates are actually pretty different, even though the GMAT percentile is is almost identical. And so the reason, the, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know if you could hear that. My watch just started making weird noises. Anyway, even if the GMAT percentiles are identical, clearly GMAT isn't everything, because if it were, then all of these schools would have like identical acceptance rates. So, and they would accept, they would all accept the same three people. This is another thing is that I often work with people who apply to these three schools and please apply to more than these three schools. Please, 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 please. Uh, anyway, and yet some people will get into Harvard, but they won't get into Stanford or they'll get into Wharton, but they won't get into Harvard. And yet on the GMAT side, they're essentially the same candidate. So hopefully this little chart, this little thought exercise has shown you that Please, GMAT's important. A low GMAT can keep you out, but please don't play the game of like, oh, I have a 770 and someone else with a 750 got in and that's not fair. Mm, maybe. Um, but GMAT does matter sometimes. Uh, the test scores, the reason they matter uh, or when they can really matter is when it's otherwise really, really difficult to tell people in an overrepresented group apart. So put another way, if a lot of people in the same group, let's say, you know, they're all software engineers or they're all, I don't know, doctors, medical doctors. If they all kind of look the same in terms of the, the pyramid, well, at a certain point, you've got to you've got to sort them out somehow. Right. Because you can't just accept everyone. So that's when, yes, it does. The GMAT will matter just because you're being compared against other people who on paper or their resumes kind of look exactly like you. So what would you do in the admissions officers? shoes, right? If you're like, I, there's 17 people here and they all have basically the same resumes. 
I might as well separate them out on GMAT. So GMAT will be important if you're from an overrepresented group. So this is a non-exhaustive list of what I mean by that. Uh, accountants, especially the auditors at the large firms, right? These are people who, I mean, all of you guys, you all kind of look the same, right? Someone's like, I audited 15, uh, I don't know, food companies. And then someone else, I audited 15 car companies and I audited 15 whatever company. And at a certain point, it's like, well, auditing is auditing. Like even if you're leading a team, which is better than just being an auditor by yourself, there, there are limited opportunities for people in auditing sometimes to influence the company. Right. It's like, OK, just come up with the numbers and tell me tell me what it is so I can file this report away and get my board off my back. <laughs> my husband is a CFO, so that is perhaps um, <laughs> that is kind of his role. He's like, just just get it done because this is painful. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, so engineers in standard engineering roles who are only doing engineering things. This is a difficult category also to differentiate between. Right. Because. If, if you're like, okay, I'm a very good engineer. I am a teapot engineer. I may I design, the my teapot is 3.6% better than the closest competitor's teapot. Like at a certain point, if I'm an admissions officer, let me not drop my teapot. Oh no, I'm gonna drop it. Um, how am I supposed to, to, to gauge between a teapot engineer versus an oil engineer who solve some sort of refinery problem versus a software engineer who solves some sort of software problem versus a mechanical engineer who solves some sort of a mechanical problem. So keeping in mind that most admissions officers don't have engineering degrees at all or scientific degrees, if they majored, many of them majored in either English or psychology, many of their backgrounds are human resources. So it's really hard for me as a reader to be like, oh, I don't know, well, this person, you know, their, their tea kettle was 4.6%. Like, it's really hard to differentiate. So that's another group where, yes, the GMAT can come into play because it's really hard to, like, I don't, how am I supposed to judge this engineer against that engineer? Uh, similar to the accountants, the FPNA, finance people, right? If you work in finance, but instead of like influencing the direction of the company, you're basically like, I'm assembling the reports and I'm putting the numbers together and I'm putting KPIs together and then I'm sending out those KPIs to other people. But if it's if it's not a role where you're having a big influence on the company, then it becomes harder. By the way, for my accountants and FP&A finance people, uh, I, my husband got this mug. Uh, it's called EBITDA, so earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, and coronavirus. So I thought maybe some of you would get a kick out of that. Um, and then management consultants, right? There's so many consultants in the applicant pool. Tech consultants, strategy consultants, HR consultants, compensation consultants, there's so many consultants, right? And so it can be tough because when management consultants are maybe not at the very tippy top firms, like maybe that next year down, or maybe they're not working on the cool, like there are some people that are management consultants and you look at it and it's like, okay, uh, someone works at McKinsey, this is a real example from someone I worked with a couple years ago. This person worked at McKinsey and they worked with the health ministry of their country and they helped transform the health uh, landscape of their country. And one of the recommendations was from, from the minister of health for their country. Okay, that person, obviously you look at that and you're like, woo, that's pretty cool. But I'm talking about the other, like the people who are like, oh, I'm a data uh, consultant and I helped implement a new documentation organization. So it's really hard to tell you guys apart, guys. So that is, I'm not, don't go out and be like, Maria said the GMAT doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. I, GMAT does matter, but it's not the most important thing. So one of the ways you can start to figure out if you are going to get into a Harvard, Wharton, or Stanford is to try to find your resume twin. This is someone who whose pre-MBA life looked kind of similar to your pre-MBA pre life, right? So someone who maybe worked at the same place in the same role and had the same professional accomplishments. Uh, Caveat on the resume twin, please make sure it's a true resume twin. I worked with someone a couple years ago who worked in ed tech, right? And they were like, well, I found my resume twin and that person got into MIT Sloan. And I said, look, I I hope I wish the best for you. I hope that it works out, but I'm I don't really think that you're going to get into MIT Sloan. And they were like, well, look, my resume twin did, but when you dug deeper, the person who got into Sloan had done ed ed tech the industry in question here's ed tech one person had like worked in ed tech and had launched their product in over a hundred schools and over over like a hundred thousand students i might be getting that wrong i know that the hundred thousand students number is right 
it was like over a hundred thousand. And then there was someone else who worked for a school, the person who was like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, okay. But they worked at one school and that school had 800 students. So if you look at the order of magnitude of impact, <laughs> you know, of the 100,000 students versus the 800 students, it's a pretty big difference. So that make that caveat when you're finding the resume twin, if you really want a good idea of where you are most likely to be competitive. Okay, I really wanted to get through that because I want us to have a common language to use to assess these examples that we're about to dig into. So we're going to cover two younger applicants who went to Wart one got into Wharton, one got into Harvard, uh, and Indian engineering applicants, one got into Harvard, one into Stanford, uh, and an older applicant who got into Harvard and Stanford, and actually the first Indian engineer also got into Harvard and Stanford, uh, and then an entrepreneur who got into Stanford. So let's look at the profile of our first uh, younger applicant. This is someone with about two, maybe three years post-college. This is someone originally from India who worked in a tech role. Um, they had attended a very, very top, 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 top U.S. graduate program. So they went to college in India, but then got into a top uh, U.S. tech program. Uh, they were working in the United States. They had gotten actually a couple of different patents in their field. Uh, they were working at a startup. So the startup wasn't really like a big name, fancy name, but the startup had really fancy clients, right? So they had fan, you know, so that was the, the way to establish the credibility of that company. Um, this person was indirectly managing a team of other engineers. Some of those engineers had been at the company for I don't know, or had been engineers, sorry, with like 20 years of experience, right? So he was literally managing people twice his age. Indirectly, he wasn't officially in charge of them, but he was still like project managing them. Um, but he also went beyond that kind of tech leadership. He also transformed the culture. So he, when he arrived, they had always done things in a certain way, and this is our process. And he was like, oh, I don't know that that's the best way. Maybe we should do it this way. And they were like, what are you talking about? This is, we've always done it this way, and that works great. And so he had to like persuade everyone in the company to start embracing his better way of uh, his better process uh, and, and you know, in order to make the whole company more nimble. So it wasn't just about having the idea of like, man, we could we're going really slowly. We could really speed this up, but then also convincing these engineers twice his age to go along with the idea. And then he also transformed another part of the culture for the sake of of confidentiality. I'm not going to get into like the super details, but it was some sort of internal process and it indirectly increased the company's valuation. So even though this person was an engineer, they had done things to to improve the culture and they had also done things to actually improve the financial uh, valuation of the company. So if we go down the list, Right, though the masters from a top program uh, points to academics, patents also point to someone who's pretty bright. Um, good career, right? I mean, the the startup itself might be a little bit iffy, but hey, that startup has pretty impressive clients. So okay, whew, that makes me feel a little bit more relieved about the career prospects. Um, managing people that are twice your age requires a lot of EQ, and then down here, these are the leadership ones, right? Anything where you're going beyond your normal scope of influence and helping change the course of the company, change the way the company does things, change the future of the company, that's that top of the, of the, of the pyramid. So that person uh, ended up going to Wharton. I have another younger applicant uh, who, I, well, let's call this person biz dev youngster. So this person only had an undergraduate degree. They had gone to sort of a top program in their country. Um, not like a super famous one, but a, a solid one. They had joined a huge global company that has billions and billions and billions of dollars a year in revenue in a rotational program. All right, that's cool. But then after the rotational program is where things get interesting. Um, this person launched an internal collaboration tool, also similar to, you know, to let's, let's, let's look, the way we do things here can be improved. So let's do things in a more collaborative way. And then here down here is where uh, things get really interesting. This person expanded the company into a new industry and not only expanded into a new industry, but when this person was like, hey, why don't we target clients over here in this other industry that we're not currently targeting? The people at his company were like, oh, no, that's never going to work. We tried that a few years ago and it was a disaster. It's never just don't even bother. Don't even bother. It's never going to work. This person bothered. <laughs> and when they did it, it worked. 
So right, oops, so right off the bat, you can imagine the recommendation letter, right, of the person who's like, yeah, three years ago, we tried it, we failed. So when this person said, let's do this, we were like, ah, don't do it. And then, oh, this person was actually really successful. And then also in this new industry, I'm going to make up an industry. Let's say it's the pet food industry, right? So this person's like, why don't we sell into pet food companies? Uh, and not only started selling into that new industry and started generating revenue from that new industry, but then was like, I know, why don't we come, why don't we try to become a thought leader in the pet food industry? Let's do like conferences for pet food companies, or let's put together white papers that will help pet, pet food companies. So that way they start to see us as a thought leader in their industry Ah, and now that's going to help establish our company's credibility in this new niche. So, um, oh, and then this one is also important. Even though this person was only two years out of college, they were actually managing a team and people on that team already had MBAs. So the academics are there, the fancy, okay, you know, big company, um, launching an internal tool to help collaboration that requires EQ, right? Sort of knowing how to sell people on an idea. Um, and then these three at the bottom are clear leadership, right? Helping the company go into a new space, establishing the company as a thought leader, and also uh, managing others who have MBAs already. So these two, I think, in case you're like, wow, what put this person over the top to get into Harvard versus other schools? I think it's these final ones down here that really change the course of the company and the direction the company was going into, and that person got into Harvard. Moving on to an Indian engineer. Um, this person, we have, I've got two of these examples. So this person went to IIT and had a high GPA, uh, had worked for two big firms in the same industry. So again, super billion dollar companies, uh, was managing teams of 30 people in this or, or more. This time, the person was actually formally in charge. They were officially the boss, as opposed to our first Indian engineer who was kind of project managing these older people, but wasn't officially in charge. This person was officially in charge. Uh, by the time they applied, they kind of moved up the engineering ranks and were trying to move over more into the business side of things. So they were managing a budget of over $60 million uh, per year. And they were also guiding the company on longer term strategic investments. So, um, you know, managing teams, big teams that requires EQ, it also requires leadership. And then having responsibility for $60 million worth of investments is also leadership. So this person went to Harvard. Um, I think an important thing that I hope that you guys are taking so far, and if you're not taking it from the first two examples, hopefully you'll take it from the third example, is that if you're an engineer and you really want to try to get into one of these top programs, it's not enough to simply be good at engineering. You need to put on your thinking cap and try to think about how can I help the company on the business side, whether that involves managing a budget, increasing revenues, reducing costs, things that have a dollar impact on the business are going to matter a lot more to a business school than, you know, whether or not your algorithm can solve a whatever optimization in 0.2 seconds versus 0.3 seconds. That kind of a detail does not matter to a business school. But if that algorithm that you developed helps save the company $100 million, ah, now we're talking. So just keep in mind as you're trying to either talk about your existing accomplishments or if you're earlier in your career and you're trying to shape the direction of your career, try to get yourself into a position where you are impacting the business and not just being very, 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 very good at engineering, but that you're actually showing that you have these other skills as well. Oh, and this person also got into Stanford, sorry. Okay, uh, another Indian applicant. Uh, this person didn't go to an IIT, uh, and they actually had a slightly below average GMAT. Mm. Uh, but they worked for one of the biggest companies in the world, uh, in the Indian division. Um, and so this here's, here's exactly what I was talking about a second ago. This person was an engineer. They designed a new product. Great, that's what engineers do, yay! But then, it turned out that the product when they first launched it wasn't really selling. And so this person went above and beyond and was like, you know what, I'm going to go out and I'm going to talk to actual customers or prospective customers. And I'm going to say, what is it? Like, why aren't you buying this product? You should totally be buying this product. Why aren't you buying it? And then based on that, this engineer came back, stepped out of the typical engineer's role and was like, look, we need to make this change to the product in order for it to increase its sales. And once they did that and they listened to him, 
boom, the sales increased and the product started being sold all over the world. So again, someone who doesn't just sit back and say, well, I designed the product. My job here is done. Time to go take a vacation. Like, no, they actually were thinking about, okay, how do I help the business, even though that's not officially my title? Um, this person also, this, this was a company that, as most big companies, it had a more, again, like a pretty slowish culture. So this person introduced hackathons in India and then the hackathons were so successful that other offices around the world, including the U.S. headquarters of this company, started implementing the same or repeating the same hackathon idea. Um, and this person had also in their spare time, time done heavy volunteer work uh, and not I know a lot of people are like, oh, I tutored a child twice. That means I have good volunteer work. Uh, a lot of people tutor kids. Right. So this person had actually done heavy volunteer work with a global nonprofit. Um, and had helped people in other countries through this nonprofit. So the academics, this is someone where if we look at the fact that it was not an IIT, it was a good school, but not an IIT, and the GMAT was below average, this is a case where the person, if we think back to the bar at that bottom of the pyramid, this person passed the bar, but kind of squeaked by on that, right? But then when the admissions reader got into the rest of the application and started seeing like, okay, hired by a big company, stepped out of their role to increase sales, stepped out of their role to launch hackathons that were super successful and does a ton of stuff through um, through nonprofits, boom, this person got into Stanford. It's interesting to note, this person got into Stanford, but they did not get into any of the, I wanna say five other programs they applied to. So they didn't get into Harvard, they didn't get into Wharton, they didn't get into MIT or Kellogg, and the usual suspects, right? So that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. I think again the global the global reach here. Um, if you notice, I'm trying to highlight the word global or international when it comes to Stanford, uh, and that's because I think that that's something that Stanford really looks for. And we'll get to that in in, in a minute. Um, oops. So here is finally an older applicant. This person had more than 10 years of experience at the same company. Normally, people with 10 years of experience or more are not often. Um, they are often discouraged from applying to full-time two-year MBA programs in the U.S. Usually people with more than 10 years of professional experience are either encouraged to pursue one-year MBAs in the U.S. or to look at programs perhaps in Europe or perhaps Canada, which tend to be a little bit more open to older candidates. Um, so this person right off the bat, you know, I think another admissions consultant was like, I don't think you should even apply because, you know, you should only apply to these one-year programs. You're a little too old. Okay, fine. But they were working at kind of a, I wouldn't say like a super famous company, but you know, a pretty-ish, well-known-ish company. But here's, in the second bullet point, here's where things start to get really interesting. This person helped launch the company in different countries around the world. So the company said to him, uh, and this was not someone from the United States, this is someone from an Asian, not India, but an Asian country. Um, and the company was like, hey, we want you to launch in this other country and we want to we want to start establishing a presence somewhere else so he was sent to uh launch the company in a couple of different countries and did so very successfully and then at the time of applying was actually managing the company's entire business in all of europe so they they part of that involved a 30 million dollar turnaround so one of the countries in europe was losing 10 million dollars a year this person got them up to over 20 positive. So it was like a $30 million total swing. Uh, and so this person's responsibility, I mean, this is really kind of, this guy is extraordinary, was managing a hundred plus million dollar PNL for all of Europe. And there were thousands of employees across Europe because this company did have, I, I should have noted this before, this person, this company was retail, had retail presence, right? So the employees were mostly retail workers, but still. So this person was in charge of all of that. So the top firm helps uh, right off the bat, okay, career, I'm feeling comfortable uh, launching in different countries around the world and doing so well, right? Because sometimes companies will like launch in a certain country and then like ugh, a few days, you know, a few years, not a few days later, sorry, a few years later, they might be like, oh, I don't know, this isn't working, let's pull out. Nope, this person did it successfully. And obviously running Europe for the company was a pretty big deal. Um, so again, I want to get across this global component. And this person got into both Harvard and Stanford. Uh, and then finally, I decided to add an example of an entrepreneur, right? Because so far, if you've noticed, most of the people 
uh, that we're talking about work for kind of famous big name companies or very large companies, with the exception of my first Indian engineer example who was at a startup, but that startup had clients who were really big. Um, so here's an entrepreneur. This person was not like a, a tech entrepreneur. This person was building a company in a very niche consumer goods, like a physical product uh, in the consumer goods sector. So attended a solid but not really famous university. I don't remember what the GMAT was, but I think it was average or below. So that academic one was, that's another case where it was like, mm, just kind of squeaking by. Uh, they were, so they started off in investment banking, but then they found that banking was sort of draining their soul. Uh, and so they left to start a mission driven consumer goods company. So the consumer good company in question was like sustainable, organic, all that stuff, right? Trying to ultimately help people instead of harm them. Um, on the personal side, there was a big, big tragedy. And this guy stuck with his co-founder, where I think a lot of other entrepreneurs would have been like, never mind, I'm out of here. So that was an interesting part of the personal story. Um, and so this person got into Stanford, and I'm, I'm just going to take a little side note here. Stanford's essay is what matters most to you and why. Uh, and they really want to get to know your personality there. They don't want you to say what matters most to me is my job. <laughs> right? They really want to get to who you are as a person. And so I think why this person was successful getting into Stanford is because they wrote their what matters most essay about not abandoning their co-founder after a pretty significant tragedy. So heads up, I thought that was, I was like, oh, Stanford's going to love the story. <laughs> um, however, it's not just about being a good guy. Uh, he, They also grew the company to a leader in their category. Now, 5 million in sales, you might be thinking, wow, like all these other examples that we've been talking about so far, we're talking 60 million, 100 million, um, 5 million is a pretty, you know, kind of a small number compared to some of the other ones we're talking about. But in this case, things are relative. So 5 million might not sound like a lot, but it was a niche consumer goods uh, product that did not have a huge market size. So this person became one of the leaders in this market. 5 million was good enough for them to become a leading company in this market. Um, and then also signed t uh, TV deals uh, sorry, signed deals with TV companies for uh, promotion and major retailers. So was able to get the product placed in a lot of retailers, which is what led to the 5 million in sales. Um, so the sticking with the co-founder after tragedy, like, yeah, like, so if we look at top, the academics, yeah, maybe not, not super, super, super high, but clearing the bar. Uh, but sticking with the co-founder after tragedy, that shows amazing amounts of EQ. That shows this is, so this is someone who has integrity and heart and compassion, right? Like this is a good human being. Uh, and that really shown through, especially in that one Stanford essay. And then obviously leadership and growing the company and expanding the company uh, into new, you know, new distribution channels through television and retail shops. So this person got into Stanford. I should also note that again, this person only got into Stanford. Um, and so, yeah, the, the category leader, the number's small, but it's all relative. Uh, and I'll give you another example. I, I visited Stanford a couple years ago, and uh, uh, Kirsten Smith, uh, you know, the head of of, of admissions there, s said that that is something that they really look for. That it really is about relative impact. So, for example, a lot of people think like, well, you have to go to IIT or an Ivy League college or a top college in your country to get into, into a place like Stanford. And she was like, no, we've actually accepted people who went to community colleges, which are not elite at all, but we accepted someone who went to a community college, but when they were at their community college, they, you know, were student body president and they launched a new whatever. Like, so they, they do take into account the context in which you're doing things. So it's not just about the absolute number in, in this case, like a revenue number. It's also about looking at these achievements in the context of this person's industry or this person's, you know, particular little niche in which they had built their little business. So what do I think separates Harvard, Wharton, Stanford, because those are the three that we're focusing on today? Before I get there, I'm just going to say, note, this is really important. At a certain point, the MBA admissions process is a crapshoot, right? And don't let anyone tell you. At a certain point, it's going to come down to luck. 
If there were only 10 applicants to business school per year, then you could say, oh, you know, they're really taking a lot of time to get to know. Look, there are thousands, right? I think there's about 10,000 applicants to Harvard Business School a year. All of them are smart. Most of them are very accomplished. So at a certain point, luck is going to play a role, right? It's not like a guaranteed admission, but you can say, well, I've got a higher chance of admission, uh, but not a guarantee. Uh, I've made this point earlier. I'm going to make it again. The process is not linear. So don't think to yourself like, okay, well, if I apply to a school that's ranked number one and I apply to a school that's ranked number five and another school that's number 10, I'm totally getting into the school rank number 10. You know, it's it's not about like, oh, this school is less elite than the other school. Therefore, I'm guaranteed to get into that school. Not really, right? Someone might get rejected uh, from some programs. I, you know, a lot of people who get into Stanford, um, a lot of people who get into Harvard uh, might also get into Stanford, but a lot of people just only get into Stanford. <laughs> I've seen that happen a lot. I've also seen a lot of people, for example, just to throw another school's name into the mix, uh, Kellogg, which is a really great school, depending on the ranking in the year, top five, definitely top 10, you know, amazing program. I've seen Kellogg reject a lot of people who end up getting into Harvard. So keep that in mind too, because I think like Kellogg rejects people kind of early-ish in the process and then they're all like sad and then like, oh, never mind. <laughs> I got to do a higher rank schools. So it's not linear because it's not about just numbers. So please spread your risk around as you apply. Head your bets. Don't say Harvard, Stanford, or bust. That is, even if you, even if you like, if you're watching this presentation and you're like, oh my God, I am totally, I see myself in these stories. I'm golden. You're not necessarily golden. Your chances might be higher, but there is no such thing as a guarantee. So please don't apply to only two or three programs. Please apply to at least six. Uh, and I don't, you know, if, if you have to force me and twist my arm and, you know, what do I think separates Wharton versus Harvard versus Stanford, aside from just the acceptance rates being different, um, you know, I, if I had to say something and I'm only doing it because otherwise you won't leave me alone, uh, of course, everyone, they, everyone has to be a high achiever. But in my experience, there are some nuances. So I think Wharton tends to be a little bit less snobby about who your employer is, but a little bit more snobby about the test scores. And again, I'm caveating, can I caveat this all over the place? Like this is, this is not a hard or fast rule. This is not an axiom of the universe. I'm just saying like occasionally this is what I see. So they're, they don't care as much necessarily about having a golden employer or having, you know, managing the $60 million PL. Um, but they do tend to be, if, if you're not in that bucket, they do tend to look for a, a stronger test score. Harvard, in my experience, tends to go for the safer bets. So mostly, um, if we look at the sort of the end of this bullet point, the people who went to the elite college and attend worked at the blue chip companies, right? Uh, like the IIT for India, McKinsey, Bain, JP Morgan, whatever, uh, Facebook, well, maybe not Facebook anymore. They're kind of falling out of favor. Uh, I would, well, anyway, uh, but you know what I mean? Like the big companies, uh, Harvard tends to go more for those safer the safer bets. So Stanford, I have found is similar to HBS, but I think that Stanford is a little bit more willing to take risks on unconventional candidates, right? Like if we think about my consumer products entrepreneur, this someone, this person didn't really go to a fancy college. They had worked in banking, but I should have mentioned this before. It wasn't a fancy bank. It wasn't even like a top 20. It was like some teeny little bank. Um, and yet this person had a really unconventional success story. And so I have found that Stanford will is a little bit more open to the less conventional person, the person maybe who has a more eccentric background or a slightly different background. As long as they've made massive impact in their little sphere, then that's one thing that they really look for. I do also think that Stanford though has the highest bar in terms of changing the world trying to change the world and make the world better on some level. Now, that's a really high bar to say you have to change the world, but I think they do look for people who have started <laughs> to change the world. Maybe they haven't gotten there yet, but they've started to do this, right? So underneath here, we've got in, in um, uh, here we go, in, in italics, I've written, this is the Stanford motto, right? Change lives, change organizations, change the world. 
So I think if you change lives um, and change organizations, then, you know, then I think that's something that Harvard, you know, that that you're more likely to get into Harvard then. But if you've changed organizations and also started to change the world, that's when I think Stanford starts to yeah, it piques their interest that they start to lean in and feel a little bit uh, more interested in this person. Changing the world could mean launching an organic. I don't know why I have pet food. I don't even own a pet, uh, but like launching launching an organic pet food company that prevents cats from getting diabetes. Right? That's that's improving the world in some way. Uh, or, but they do really like sort of this either international experience or international impact. Um, and then I'm just going to end real quick with, uh, you know, I think we've we've been talking about these successful people and these super nosebleed elite schools. I'm just going to leave you with this thought. Um, I don't think that it's worth obsessing over the sort of Harvard Stanford Wharton obsession that people get into. I, I sort of get it on some level, but I don't think it's worth obsessing over. Uh, the t the fact is that most top business schools. And the top sort of 10 to 15, even 25 in the US, for example, just to, again, this is not like a science, I'm just sort of picking a number off the top of my head. Um, they're going to result in wonderful career opportunities. And if you had, if you enter this process with a, it's Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, or nothing else, it's a recipe for heartache. Because at a certain point, it comes down to luck. At a certain point, you know, 90% of people who apply to Harvard are getting rejected and not all those 90% are like losers, right? Those 90% are mostly people who have 730 GMATs, who have a lot of experience, et cetera. So please don't go into it with this mindset that's really damaging. You're just gonna set yourself up for potential heartache. Um, and so if we, if we think back to this little chart that I had earlier, I just wanted to add a new um, sort of column to it. And that is the average starting salary. So we're running out of time, so I can't go down the list. But basically, I want I just want to point out the highest number at Stanford at 157. Harvard's down a little bit less. Wharton's a little bit less. But it's not like if you don't go to Harvard, Stanford, or Wharton, like, oh, you're going to be penniless. You're, you're going to make $2,000 a year. Really? Will you? Like, sometimes people are like, oh, I have to go to, I have to get to Harvard. Really? I mean, do you have to? Because if you go into one of these other programs that have, you know, the ones at the bottom, that in some cases are more um, are easier to get into, not necessarily Haas. I, Haas's acceptance rate is actually <laughs> lower than Wharton's. Um, but you know, these quote unquote. When sometimes people are like, "Oh, I guess you know, I don't want to apply to any safety school, whatever." I, anyway, I hate that terminology. Um, but like, it's not like a massive, a massive difference in in immediate post-graduation salaries, right? The lowest on the list is Yale at 134, which makes sense because Yale does tend to attract people who are interested in social enterprise. So it's not that corporate employers don't value Yale graduates. It's just that Yale graduates tend to self-select into slightly lower paying roles because Yale tends to attract people who are more interested in social enterprise, you know, education, environment, that sort of thing. And so those jobs tend to be lower paying. So, but even then, it's a 15% difference. Um, you know, Stern actually has a, you know, pretty good starting salary. So it's not like you're still going to get a really good job if you go to one of these top programs, not just the top three. And it's not like you make twice as much money if you get into Stanford versus Yale. Right? We're not talking like a 3x, 5x, 10x difference. It's a 15, the, the biggest, I calculated it last night, the biggest difference between the two is about 15% on this list. Not, not like, you know, totally mind blowing changing. Uh, and then you're like, okay, Miss Smarty Pants, that's the post MBA salary. Uh, fine. You're right. They're, they're pretty, I mean, they're pretty similar in terms of like in the big picture of life. Um, but what about the long run, right? Because after all, Harvard, Stanford, Wharton graduates, they go on to become the Fortune 500 CEOs, and they go on. Do they, though? So I've, I've got a couple little things I'm going to leave you with. Um, number one, first of all, you unlike, unlike other professions, you don't need an MBA to succeed in business. If you want to become a neurosurgeon, yeah, you need a medical school degree for that, right? <laughs> but you don't need an MBA to succeed in business. And in fact, 
um, on this chart here, we've got, this is kind of a, a survey of some CEOs. Um, and if you Google this, you'll find like there's fortune, I think people have done studies on this. Um, so like for North America, for some of these CEOs, like less than half of them even had an MBA. And we haven't even gotten into the fact, if you start digging into it, some of the MBAs uh, who do end up leading Fortune 500 companies, yeah, sometimes it's fancy schools, but sometimes it's like the local school because the person went there at night and got their MBA on the weekends or evenings. So it's not like it's 100% like, oh, if you don't get an MBA, your career in business is never going to happen. And then my response to when people say, well, then why is it that when I look at, you know, these things, like so many people from these top schools end up achieving a lot. I, I would I would take that information or that mindset with a grain of salt and I would ask myself, okay, what's the causality? Is it that the school is what made those people successful? Maybe. Or is it more, and this is what I think it is, that the schools look for people, that they accept people who are already on the way to being successful anyway. So my belief is that it's not that the school, it's not like a school takes a raw lump of clay and just molds it into like high achieving CEO. The top schools look for people who are already on their way to becoming, that, that you, people who have, um, well, how should I put this? People who have exhibited the characteristics of being on their way to becoming a CEO. People who have exhibited those leadership traits that really help them stand out. And so the schools are like, well, I'm going to place my bet on this person because look at what they've done in the past. So I don't necessarily think that the causality is because of the school transforming the person. I think the school picks the special people and therefore hopes that those people are going to go on to make a lot of money or start a company or do whatever it is. So that is my presentation for today. I'm sorry that I ran about two minutes over. Um, if you want to check out more advice from me, uh, please go to applicantlab.com. Am I still sharing my screen? Cancel. Uh, oh, screen sharing was canceled. Okay, sorry. I <laughs> just wanted to make sure that like you, I was talking now. Um, Okay, so I unfortunately, uh, sometimes I have time to hang out after these sessions and answer lots of questions. I don't think I do today. Sorry, guys, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, uh, this week happens to be, I counted it a couple days ago, there are 18 major programs in the US and Europe that have deadlines this week. And today is Harvard, and today is Wharton, and tomorrow is Stanford. So as you might imagine, uh, I have a lot to do today <laughs> with my with my with my job, uh, and so I cannot unfortunately hang out this time to do questions. But if you hit the like button uh, on this YouTube video, then it's going to be that much more likely that GMAT Club asks me to come back again. Uh, and what I did, I don't remember if this was like a month ago or so. I actually did a session, I think a month ago, where. Um, where I literally, it was just like, I didn't even have an agenda and I was like, just ask questions. And I think we just spent a whole hour taking questions from you guys. So if you're interested in that, let GMAT Club know and maybe they'll invite me back. Uh, but unfortunately today, I it's kind of a big day in my world. So I do have to go, but thank you. I hope that this was useful and it gave you some food for thought. Uh, like the session again, so that way they, they invite me back. And uh, best of luck to all of you in your admissions processes.